sing of my Redeemer and His heavenly love to me. He from death to life has brought me, Son of God, with Him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With His blood He purchased me on the cross. My pardon, pay the debt, and set me free. Well, amen. We're glad to have you here this morning with us. Pretty good day to get started. Another Lord's Day, and we're glad to celebrate. This is the last Sunday of the month. You know that, right? And uh, we're praying that God gives mercy and grace, and we see the Lord lo lo up, lighten up the load a little bit that's in our country. And you pray for our leadership. Would you do that? And with that said, let's have a word of prayer. We, need, we have several in our family and loved ones around us and friends of ours who have lost loved ones in these days that we've been confined. And uh, you remember them. You think about it, give them a call and ask God's grace on their life when you're not talking to them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. And thank you, Lord, for the provision. Lord, we know that out there, there are a lot of people who are hurting, not just because of this isolation, but Lord, because of the loss of loved ones. Some, Lord, separated from their loved ones because of <clears throat> the time that we live in. And Lord, I'm praying that you bless them and comfort them. I pray, Father, that you would also be with those that are needing surgeries. And Lord, I pray that you would remember each one on our own church prayer list and that you'd bring mercy into their life. And Lord, if it's possible, that they can get that scheduled and get it taken care of. And we ask you, Lord, all the things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're glad they're with you. We want to continue our singing today. Turn back with me to page 177. Great is thy faithfulness. And if there's anything we can say about God, it's that he is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fill not. As thou hast been, thou for Hey! 
Good morning. Last Sunday morning service of the month, and we're glad that you're here with us. The months are moving by fast, but not fast enough for all of you that are caught in your homes and not able to travel around. Miss everybody. I have a message for you this morning that uh, I, I say a lot, but I've never preached on it, and so I'm going to preach on it this morning. And I'm sure a lot of you are praying, and you have prayer requests, and you've prayed for certain things. And in your life, God either doesn't answer or he just outright says no. We're grateful for that wonderful special Jocelyn sang, and of course it goes along with the message this morning because I want you to look in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter number 3 in verse 23, 24, 25, and 26. Moses was probably one of the most familiar people with God in the Scripture. You could line those up. You know, Abraham and Jacob and, and Moses and David. and We could just go through those guys. But if you look through all their lives, you will find somewhere in their lives that God told them, just plain out told them, no. You take the life of Moses, 
And Moses had a plan. You can read it in chapter number 7 of the book of Acts. Stephen relates it to us. Moses' plan was that he would be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and he would be the Pharaoh of upper and lower Egypt. He would be the most powerful man in the world. He would set his people free and he would be the national hero for the ever and ever. And God... um, allowed Moses to say, hear something from his voice, not so much exactly as he does in Deuteronomy this time, but you look through that and you'll find Stephen tells us that God had another plan. God wanted to be glorified in that, and God wanted to be the one who brought his people out. And God was going to use this man, Moses, but when he said, uh, you're not going to do it by being Pharaoh, you're going to be it by being lower than a shepherd. You're not going to just lead sheep for 40 years. You're going to lead people for 40 years through the desert. God said, you know what, Moses? Mm, no. Look what in the book of Deuteronomy. Let me show you another time. God told Moses, no. Let's start reading with me in verse 23. It says, and I besought the Lord. That's Moses, of course. That time, God had just got through telling them what he's going to do with Israel once they get in the land. Boy, it sounded really good. Moses, I said, I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness, thy mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works, according to thy mind. I pray thee, let me go over and see the land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain, and Lebanon. And the Lord was wroth with me. I don't know if you know or understand that word wroth, but it means angry, upset. For your sakes, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee. Now, if it's a kid, he heard this from his parents. That's enough. Speak no more unto me of this matter. And the answer is pretty plain Moses, that's enough. The answer is no, you're not going. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. How did Moses get to this point? He's called the friend of God. He's called the man that God speaks to face to face like he does a man. What happened that causes Moses to get in this situation where God God says, you're not going into the land. And when Moses keeps asking him, keeps asking him, he finally says, Moses, that's enough. No, you're not going. Got your Bible with you this morning. Start with me over in the book of Exodus chapter 17. The people of Israel had come out of Egypt and they were traveling through the desert up through uh, a pretty rough part of the country on the other side, south of Engadai. They were around this mount called Horeb and it was not like a great, wonderful place. It was a desert place. It's pretty much, the, it was exactly the same place that Moses saw the burning bush. It might have been a good place to take sheep to graze on what was there, but it wasn't a good place to live. It was no water, no food. The people started griping. And the, Moses told the, the Lord, and the Lord told Moses to do this in Exodus 17, 5 and 6. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. Go out there in front of them. Take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod which thou smotest the river. Remember when he turned it to blood and did everything else he did? Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock of Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And you know the story. Water came out of it, not just a little sprinkling of the water. It wasn't a fountain. It was a river of water, and it fed millions of people and all their stock and everything to do and became a river. Unfortunately, they didn't get to stay there. They left that rock and they started on a 40 year circle journey most of the time they made the circle in a year they walked out went toward the east went toward the north came back toward the west and came back south and they came right back to that same rock almost every year when they did it on another year the bible says they came to that same rock Don't know if it was the next year or the next year or the next year. Don't know. They needed water. 
And God told Moses what to do. Watch. Numbers 20, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, you know all those important people, thou and Aaron thy brothers, and speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. Remember the first time he said you strike the rock with your rod. Second time he said take the rod with you, but speak to the rod. Now the Bible says in verse 9, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto him, unto them, he's a little peeved at them. Watch this. Hear ye now, you rebels! Must we fetch you water out of the rock? Now, I'm not going to say anything there about who's rebellious or who's not. But I will tell you that I do know who brought the water out of the rock, and it wasn't we. And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beast also. Now look at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore, Ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, you folks that have problem with ye and you, let me explain some little detail for you. You, you have, when we say that, I'm not sure if you're talking about one person or a whole bunch of people. You. But when you say ye, you, you understand this. He's being specific. He's talking to you guys. You what, Moses? You and Aaron, both of you, you're going to die on this side of the Jordan River and you will not go into the land because of what you just did. You say, what in the world? Have you ever, um, have you ever played baseball? You remember that song that the Oak Ridge Boys were just saying? Playing baseball with shirt rocks and using sawmill slats for bat? All of you rich people that grew up with lots of money and all kinds of stuff, I'm sure you, 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 you don't have a clue what he's talking about. I grew up around sawmills. I grew up around rock places. I grew up in the country. And it was kind of a fun thing. You go out there, they, had, they cut the edge off of a board where the bark was. They wanted the, bark, the tree without, the wood to be without bark on it. So they cut that off. That's called a slat. They used it for other stuff. You could burn it and do all that kind of stuff, but they didn't make lumber out of it. And a shirt rock, for those of you who don't know, never been to Alabama, that's the rock that's just everywhere. You put it on the roads, you put it out. You toss that rock, rock up in the air and you whack it with that piece of sawmill slant. Remember that? Well, I want you to know something. There, I've, I done, I've done that a thousand times. Not one time did I get in trouble with the Lord for hitting a rock with a piece of wood. And I'm not sure how many rocks in the whole world got hit with a piece of wood. And you know nothing about the story of it. I loaned one of my really good aluminum bats one time to a, a kid that I knew, and he found out you could hit golf balls. Man, you could hit them 100 yards. Of course, you should have seen what it done to the bat. God didn't say anything to the kid about that. I want you to get this, though. What was the reason Moses got in trouble for doing that? Well, you have the answer in your Bible. And it's pretty easy. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. That rod represented the judgment of God. That's what it did. He brought, that rod brought the judgment down. The judgment of God overpowered the judgment of, of Pharaoh. The judgment of God could turn the whole place into blood, blood. The judgment of God, the power of God could open the Red Sea. That would eventually drown the Egyptians. That stood for the judgment of God. That rock represented Christ. And the water that flew out of it was the Holy Spirit. You say, how do you know that? Got it right here in 1 Corinthians one time. Show you a few other times later on. But right now, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would that not that you be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. That sea was a picture type of death. For the one that was redeemed like Israel, they could just walk right through it. 
But those who were not redeemed, like Egypt, were kept bound up in it. They were all walked through the sea. They were under the cloud. They were under that cloud. That cloud represented the presence of God in the daytime and the fire by night. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat? They, every one of them, ate the manna that came down from heaven. Guess what? Jesus said, I am the manna. Every one of them in picture type took the Lord Jesus. But look what it says. They did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember I told you they circled around, they circled around, they circled around, and they came back every year to the same rock. That rock followed them. You ever been lost? Make circles, come back, you know, either we're making circles or that tree is following me. That's what he said. That rock was Christ. That rod was the judgment of God. That water was the picture type of the Holy Spirit. And I got you to know something, that from the beginning, it was always said, and it's one time, over and over and over, Paul would say it, every New Testament epistle would say it, it would say, Christ is to be smitten once. Once in the end of time, and never again. For now on, you just speak to Him. That's what the Hebrew writer said. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of any. Unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 10.10 said, By the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. First Peter said, For Christ hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, being quickened by the Spirit. Now, aren't you glad that Jesus... One time, offering himself for sin covers every sin for everybody forever. Moses, in his anger, broke the picture type. And he lost his right to enter in to the promised land. And no matter how much he begged God, God said, that's enough, Moses. No. In Deuteronomy 34, Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that was over against Jericho. Let him look across and see it. The Lord said to him, This is the land which I swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will surely give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. There in the land of Moab, according to the word of God. Remember what I read to you in Deuteronomy 3.26? The Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me this matter. No. Moses broke the picture type. And the Lord told him, no. It's pretty tough to get told no, isn't it? I don't think Christians like being told no. We, we like better to think, well, God just didn't answer my prayer. God just didn't step in. I know that God didn't do this. Can I tell you in my lifetime, the Lord's told me no more than once. Back in the old days, you know, when I first came to Texas, I took Bethel Baptist Church, and it was in pretty rough shape, and uh, I, I was a brand new pastor. I'm not sure that I, I knew a whole lot about what I should have been doing, but I knew, thought I knew what I could do. And I tried working at it. And it, it, it was a rather, uh, what's the word? Poor church, money-wise. You had a lot of people in it who grew up in churches and a lot of things. And some of them were just absolutely dead set against it, tithing to the Lord, supporting the church, doing all of it. And, and I will tell you, when it came to building and the people and the property, all were in, in kind of real repair. There were really good people in it. Really good people. I learned to love them. But uh, it was pretty tough. Now, I, I learned to live on a little bit of money. It, we didn't make a whole lot working at the children's home. Didn't make a whole lot working at the first church I was an associate pastor in. The second church, I'm sorry. 
But I want you to understand, you can't live on anything. And I remember coming to the place in my life, I had a little girl, and she was about two years old, and she was born with holes in her eye teeth. And they got worse as they went forward, and I remember one night discussing it with my wife, you know, what were we going to do? We were trying to find money to just pay for, like, eating. I, on top of that, I got to Texas, and the only car that I had and the only vehicle at the church that was worth much was, wasn't any close to drivable. I worked on them, and they got to be that way. But can I tell you, there, there wasn't money to take her. And I remember wondering, Lord, what in the world have you brought me to? And you know what happened? I'm going to give you a real personal experience here. Had a company out of Mississippi, a startup company that was, had just boomed from the beginning. It was a cable company, and they were looking for an engineer. They called me and said, Hey, George, will you consider coming to work for us? Now, we're talking in 1977, maybe early 78, guys. We'll start you out at $1,000 a week. Can I tell you, I prayed about it. Lord, look, at this don't look like it's working. It looks like I've done something I shouldn't have done. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe I don't know how to. You know what the Lord told me when I prayed about that? The very first time. He said, no. Did you ever ask those questions? Well, Lord, if, if I can't do that, how am I going to make it? Well, look at me. Did we make it? Yeah, we did. Did God bless? He sure did. Lots of souls ended up getting saved at the Bethel Baptist Church in East Fort Worth. Ronnie, Ronnie Reese got in there. We started working and people running the bus. And some days, guys, we'd have a hundred kids. I've seen days we had a hundred kids. Brother Reese would have them in junior church and have seven, eight, nine, ten of them saved the same day. Yeah. Wonder what would have happened if I just said, well, I don't care what the Lord said. I don't like it because he said no. I'm going anyhow. And I'm grateful that God somehow in His mercy allowed me to understand what it's like when God says no. You say, well, who else did He tell no? Well, have you ever read your Bible about David? God tells him no. I can tell you almost every man out there that God would tell him no. The Apostle Paul had an affliction in his flesh. When you read it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7, he tells you something. I mean, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 12, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. See, this. if this was preaching instead of Sunday school, I'd have to start all over, but I'm not. In verse number 7, he said, Unless I should be exalted above measure. This is the guy that was carried up to heaven and seen heavenly things and... God told him you can't tell, but you can just tell him you went, and he did. All right. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that were given to me, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, I've heard preachers try to figure out what this is. <clears throat> Some of them think it was the persecution. Some of them think it was somebody personally. Paul calls it the messenger of Satan to buffet me. I, I believe it was a physical problem. I actually believe it was the blindness that kept him from being able to write his own letters. He dictated almost all of them. Lest I should be exalted above measure. If you go back and read what he wrote to Galatians, he says, you know, one time you loved me enough you'd have taken your eyes out and given them to me. And now because, and he talked about not looking so pretty. Don't know what exactly what it was. But look at verse 9. Verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times that it might depart from me. Paul healed the sick. Paul raised the dead. Paul saw miracle after miracle from God through his hand performed on people. 
But listen to what happened one time when he said, God, will you take this away from me? Verse 9, And he, God said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what Paul said? He said, no. Lord, won't you take this away from me? Don't you understand how much better I could serve you? Don't you think? And God said, no. Nope, not going to do it. Look at the next statement Paul makes. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, hey, Lord, will you take that away from me? And God said, no. Can you believe that? The man Moses, God told him no. The apostle Paul, God told him no. Who would have thought God would have the ability? And guess what? We, we're, we're just amazed, sometimes angry. We get upset when something in our life we love, somebody we love, something we care about greatly, and all those things that we could say, Lord, what's wrong with you? But when we ask, God says, no, no. Now I want you to think about with me what makes the difference when God says no. And we're going to go to a particular place that includes Paul. But Paul and his group had wanted to go north. And you, if you read it, you'll see it. Then they thought, well, maybe we'll go south. Hmm. Then they thought, well, maybe we'll go east. But every time the Holy Spirit said no, no, no. But when they prayed about it and they fasted, God led them west. Now, I don't know how much study you'd like to do, but if you study Christianity, you're going to find something that with just a few exceptions, the gospel went from Jerusalem west and went around the world that way. Acts 16, verse 6 through 9 says, Now when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach in the word in Asia, after they were come Masia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. But they, passing by Masia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood up a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. Can we go east, Lord? Nope. Can we go west, Lord? Yes. Isn't that strange? The Lord told them no when they wanted to go east and south and north. But you know what happened? When Paul understood that and he took it for what God wanted to do that would be the greatest thing in their lifetime instead of some kind of restriction on him personally, those seven churches of Asia Minor that you read about were all founded and through some of those churches the gospel got spread out to the whole world. God knew what he was doing, didn't he? God knew what he was doing. Because of their obedience, God began to establish those Gentile churches toward the West. You know, obedience is not just being able to abide by the commands of God. You go back in your Bible and notice something about the Ten Commandments. A very whole lot of them say, thou shalt not. You know, that's kind of like saying no, right? Matter of fact, once you get your concordance down, look how many times in your Bible God says to everybody, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It means no. It's no. I understand modern Christianity, guys, believes that our God is like some kind of genie. And if you rub it the right way, then he'll give you whatever you want and there won't be any downside to it. Can I tell you this? I want to remind you something for us. And I have to remind myself daily. For you're bought with a price. You know what it took to get me where I'm at? It took the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. God gave his only begotten son. Paul would say, what? No, you're not, but you're bought with a price. You're not your own. Now, I'm wonderful in, in Christ, we have such freedom. We've forgotten that we're God's. If it was another way around and our God was the owner of a slave and we were his slave, not 
by force. How many times would we say to a, a master, well, I heard you say no, but I'm going to do it anyhow. God will tell you no. And I promise you, a lot of the Christians that we know today who are suffering in the world today is because they heard God say no. And they did it anyway. Obedience is not just abiding by the commands of saying, love your brother, but I'm doing that. It's the ability to say, thou shalt not come nigh to thy neighbor's wife. Obedience is being willing to abide by the commandments and the will of God when it's contrary to our desires. Lord, that's not what I wanted. When it's contrary to our desires, and we still do it, listen to me, in peace. Lord, I don't understand this. I don't like it. I'm not sure that I'll ever get used to it, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to do it because I trust you and I'm going to put it down and let it go and just keep moving forward and do it in peace. You ever seen those Christian people that carry those grudges around? Yeah, you know them, don't you? Something happened to them in the past. Something went wrong in their life. Some family member did something. Some, and they carry it around like, it's a, like, a, like it burns into their flesh and in their brain and in their soul. And they've, they've lost their joy and they've lost their peace and they've... They, they think they're walking with God, but I'm going to tell you something. When you walk with God, John says you'll have fellowship one with another. So when we're having problems with all our brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's nobody perfect but you, I'm going to promise you you're not walking with God. Somewhere out there, God told you to do something or not to do something, and you didn't do it. It turned out bad. And you can't get over it. How much better would have been if you, when you heard God say no, you say, Lord, I don't, you know, he never told me I had to like that. Never did tell me I had to like those things. But I have to believe that he's God in charge of everything. If he wasn't, why would he love me? Why would he pay the price he did for me? Obedience is willing to do it with peace in your life. Obedience is accepting the answer of God when he says no. Most of you have heard me tell the story of Kylie and talking to another man. And I, I've, never, I've never met an atheist, okay? And I know there's thousands and probably millions of people who claim to be atheists. Most of them are just really wounded deists. They believe in a God. They're just really angry at him because he didn't do what they wanted. I loved my son. I loved my daughter. I loved my wife. I loved my husband. And God took it away from me. And, and you're going to hold it against him. I sat right there by their bedside and 10 or 15 times I prayed, Lord, don't let this happen. Don't let this happen. Lord, don't let this. And, and you know what? Did God ever just really speak in your ear or did you listen when he said no? Maybe he didn't have to do it audibly. But he said it in his will. Being told no never has made us happy. I found out something about kids. Pretty much the first word they learn is no. No. Because they hear it all the time. No, don't stick your finger in that light socket. No, don't put that dog food in your mouth. Hey, no, don't hit your brother or sister with that. And pretty soon, the, one of the first things they say is, and guess what? One of the first things they repeat back to you when you tell them, no. And you have to have discussions with them about who gets to tell who no. Maybe you haven't with your kids, but I discuss that with my children. And God discusses it with me. The greatest thing you can ever do in your Christian life to make your life happier, more peaceful, and actually a great fellowship with God and the other Christian people is to understand that what we, we say in the secular world when we're talking about sexual relationship, no means no. No argument about it. Just it means no. Now I'm, I'm thinking with me that you need to get one more example 
And I'm going to give it to you. It's about a guy named Balaam. Balaam was about to go with Balak. And God said to him, Thou shall not go with them. Now, I'm, Balaam came in. Let me just read the verses to you. And I'll, I'll put them up on the board here for you. Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Ooh, you know that. He's looking down from the mountains of Moab, and there's people come out of Egypt who look like a quail of ants forever. Which cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to come them and drive them out. God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now that should have been enough for Balaam, but it wasn't. The Bible says that Balaam rose up in the morning. He asked again, he asked again, he asked, you know, I'm telling you. And every time they keep coming back with a better reward, hey, if you'll do it, we'll give you this. Hey, if we do it, more important people came down. Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. There's, there's, a, good, there's a good story there. Does it seem like you and God are crossways with each other once in a while? Maybe it's because you're disobedient. Now, I, I want you to know everybody's allowed to make mistakes. Everybody's allowed to make mistakes. And God allows us so many mistakes, and he passes it off with us, and we answer what we do, we suffer for it, or we rewarded for it. But I want you to get this. Never in my whole lifetime have I ever said, well, you know, that's an honest mistake. When somebody came to me and they said, hey, preacher, can I do this? And I say, no, don't do it. I've never had an employee that I've had come and say, hey, preacher, can I do this? And I say, no, don't do it. And then come back later and find out, and they'll say, well, I know I work for you and everything, but I, and I heard you tell me no not to do it, but I decided it was a better thing if I just went ahead and did what I wanted. Employees... Usually, in this situation, I don't remember one that hasn't happened, cease to work for me when they belligerently disobeyed. You say, well, what's he mad at me about? You know, that's a strange thing. Did you see what it says? And God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, I want you to think about this for me just a little bit, who this guy is. Israel has been in Egypt for 400 years. Yet God still had men who knew him, talked to him, and were priests, and they had led other folks around. There are people all over that did that. And this Balaam guy was one of those. And everybody knew whose servant he was. When God told him, no, don't go, and he went. God was upset about it. And he put an angel. And the Bible says he came to that place. And of course you know the story. He's riding on his donkey. And his donkey sees the angel with his sword drawn out. Waiting for Balaam to get close enough. And the donkey fell on the ground. And then Balaam talks to him. and <sighs> Well, we won't say anything about people in rebellion against God, will we? Now, Balaam refused to obey God for three reasons, and God explains it to us, all of them in the New Testament. You ready? Number one, he disobeyed God because of his way. What do you mean his way? The way he'd been going all of his life. You know what I can tell? If I'm walking through and, uh, and you say you're in the snow and you see these foot tracks and you... You find a guy, and the foot tracks lead north, and you say, hey, how have you been all your life? He goes, pretty good. I said, where you been? He goes, well, I've been over there, but his foot tracks go that way. I'm thinking he's not telling me the truth. You know what his way was? The direction of his life? Second Peter verse chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says, Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, 
On heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's what he said. That's the way of Balaam. Balaam disobeyed God because of his error. You find that in Jude 10. The error. Jude 10 says, And woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gang sayings of Kor. Now I want you to get this. He sticks him right in the middle of that with the error. Cain's trouble was, he said, I'm doing it my way. Kor's was, I want to be in charge. And Balaam's was, I want to do it for profit. Neither one of those things is God in. But there's one more thing. Balaam disobeyed God because of his doctrine. You know what his doctrine was? Not that I can reach people, and bring them to God, but that I can reach people and bring them under my authority. Well, I am something. I'll be their God. I'll be over them. And the ones, you know how most people do that? You know how most corrupt preachers, I don't cult leaders do that? They find the weakness of the person they're dealing with. I don't care what it is. Mental, physical, weird desires, whatever it is. And they perpetuate those. Israel was no group of sinless people. They'd been in, in captivity for, four, uh, for about 400 years and they hadn't had much training other than just their normal stuff. They had a lot of problems with the flesh. But the Revelation writer in chapter 2 verse 14 says, but Jesus talking to a church, listen to what he said. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that, behold, that hold the doctrine of Balaam. What was his doctrine? What's his doctrine? His doctrine was, well, let's look at it. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. God would not let him allow the other people to destroy him in a war. But you know what he did? He taught Balak. He said, you know what? God's going to protect them because they're following him. All you got to do is get them to quit following God. It was his doctrine. And Balak, if you go back and read the scripture in Numbers, you'll find that he did. He didn't send an army down there. He sent lasciviousness and ungodliness and filth of the flesh. And, and God ends up sending a plague and thousands and thousands and thousands of them died. Because when God told him no, that's not what he wanted to hear. He had other plans. Well, one thing here, and let's, let's get through this. The Christian who hears the voice of God telling them no and believe God knows best has the greatest proof in themselves that their faith is real. Has the greatest hope that God's going to bless their faith and has the greatest peace because they believe in the promises of God. Show me a person who's not willing to be told no, and I'll show you a person that lacks all three of those in their life. Genesis 22, the story of Abraham. God called him. He said, take thy son, thine only son, take him to this place. And it took him three days to get there. Wasn't that something? Wasn't that something? And said, by Myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and not withheld thy son, thine only son. In blessing I'll bless you, multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess, possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. You know what he did? God told him, take your son, go down there, and I want you to offer him for a sacrifice. You know the one I said, your progenity is going to go through this son, not Ishmael, not all those, but Isaac. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. I want you to go offer him for a sacrifice. 
Now, me and you both know something. Isaac represented the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son. And Abraham represented the Lord's father, the almighty God, and willing to sacrifice his son for us. You say, well, can you imagine the agony Abraham is in? I bet he asked the Lord those three days traveling, saying, Lord, can we not just change this? Can we not just change this? Can we not just change this? Lord, could we not just change this? And how many times do you think in those three days the Lord told him no? Can you imagine the Lord himself, our Father in heaven, with the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross and then crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I don't know. I know the Lord Jesus can cry. I don't know, God, if he can. But I can tell you it was no fun time for him. No. Tough sermon, isn't it? Sometimes the hardest things we ever do in life is just hearing God say, no. The Lord said in Isaiah, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because thou he trusted in thee. Trust thee in the Lord forever, for he is the Lord Jehovah, his everlasting strength. You may be listening to this today and God's told you no about something and you're a little upset. Well, go ahead and get over it. God will let you. But don't lose your faith in God. Hang on to it. Keep that proof in yourself. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Do you know that? Don't give up that great hope that God's going to do something with that. Look what he did with Abraham because he would have obeyed him to the last minute. Believed God was going to do a miracle. Go back and read Hebrews 11. He was going to do it. And he, he lose the greatest peace. Have you ever disobeyed God and kept the peace of God in your life? No. You know, I think what it's time for us to do is to remember that God is God. We're His. And every once in a while, and all those yeses and all those okays and I will for you. Every once in a while he'll say no. And I'm supposed to understand that he does it in love and grace and mercy and for my benefit. And when I do that, I got the greatest proof of my faith, not to everybody else, to me. The greatest hope in my life, I might not be able to explain it, but I will. And the greatest peace, because I believe God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Today, I'm asking you, Lord, to, to remind us that as the God of heaven, the creator, the sustainer, the mighty God, the Savior, and Lord, ours, our Father. Help us to be able to understand when we say no. It's the greatness of our God, the wonder of His love, and the proof of our relationship. We believe you, God. Help thou our infirmities and our unbelief help us to be able to pray you for the times you say no and we ask it in Jesus name Amen